to the future is about to start. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So this is unusual. Uh, most people, when they think of car racing, they think of huge, powerful internal combustion engines, you know, ripping noise, lots of fumes, lots of excitement. But we're here to talk about an entirely new type of car racing. And, and and why it matters, and it, and it really does, and we'll get into that a little later. But Alejandro, um, you sort of got into uh, the idea of Formula One electric car racing, not exactly directly. Can you tell us you know, how you got involved in this? Well, we've been in the world of racing for, for, for many years. Uh, we are a group that comes really from, from, from the races. Mm -hmm. But we thought there was a big opportunity to, to make a contribution uh, through motorsport, mm -hmm. because there are many more sport fans than environmentalists, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or, I don't know. Um, so we thought that motorsport was a good way to pass this message of sustainability to a big, big audience. Mm -hmm. If you target only environmentalists, you're targeting a smaller target. If you go to the wide audience of sports and of motorsport, you can really get this, this, this message through. So. So, yeah. but, but just what I was getting at, you were a politician before you got into car racing, right? Actually, yeah, yeah. Is there anything in common between the two? Not really, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, that, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a strange combination. Yeah, I, I, I started politics when I was very young. Um, in, um, You're the youngest uh, member of the European Parliament, yeah. Parliament, right? I was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, few, a few years ago. So I started, yeah, I started when I was 18. Uh, I was elected to Parliament when I was 28. Before that, I was in government, and um, and then I stopped politics uh, to go to business and mainly to the business of motorsport. Mm -hmm. It's um, more fun. It's much more fun. <laughs> uh, did a small stop also in football, right. which wasn't that fun. Right. And uh, definitely, motorsport is where, where I've been focusing the last. So the explain last. to us what it is, what Formula E is. Now, first of all, you've got ten teams. Tell us some of the people who own the, the racing teams. So Formula E is a global championship, like Formula One, but with electric cars. Uh, you're going to have, have how many races? Ten races around the world. Starting? In Beijing in four months. In September, we have the first race in Beijing, which we think is a good symbol. Beijing is a, is a city with a big problem of pollution. And uh, to start this new championship there, we want to send the message that the electric car is the solution for the cities now. Mm -hmm. Beijing, then we go to Malaysia, we'll be in Miami, we'll be very near here in LA, in Long Beach. Monte Carlo, Berlin, London, many cities around the world, always in the center of the cities. Okay. Ten teams from all over the world. We have well, Leonardo DiCaprio, for example, involved in one team. Venturi, we have uh, Richard Branson with Virgin, uh, has another team. Mm -hmm. We have brands like Audi, uh, ABT, another team. Um, Mahindra from India, teams from Japan, China. Mm -hmm. So really, really a global uh, championship. Right. Now, I'm sure what everybody in the audience is thinking is like how long are the electric cars going to last on the track, or do they drag extension cords with them around <laughs> the circuit? So what, about 25 minutes per yes. car? Uh, so how do you have a race where the car's only going to last for 25 minutes? So that's a very good question. That's the question we asked ourselves when we were launching the championship. <laughs> and there were three, re three solutions. One was to do 25 minute long races, which was definitely not a good solution because they would be too short. The second solution was to wait for 10 years or 20 years until you have batteries that are better, <laughs> but we really didn't want to wait that much. The third solution was to change either the battery or the car. Mm -hmm. The batteries we cannot change, which seems like the most common sense idea. You stop your racing car, you swap battery. Mm -hmm. We cannot because the battery is protected uh, under the structure of the car, very, very integrated with the chassis. Mm -hmm. So we just... You could do it, but it might take a couple of days. It would right? take, yeah, I mean, an, an hour and a half, probably. <laughs> an hour and a half, yeah. okay. Um, so we went to the change of cars. Mm -hmm. So every driver has two cars. Mm -hmm. And in the pit stop, the driver jumps from one car to his next car, which is fully charged, and goes on. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. This will give a rise, race time of about an hour, which is ideal for television, mm -hmm. and especially for the new generation of fans, the kids, which are our target, mm -hmm. who don't like to watch. They like to play, to participate. So. Right. So apparently you can, part of the strategy of winning a race is, is deciding how you're going to drive those cars and how you're going to program those cars, right? I mean, you can, you can go for speed, you can go for distance. I mean, explain a little bit the strategy of winning a Formula E race. Well, everything now in racing, not only Formula E, but also Formula One, endurance, is about energy management. Mm -hmm. So the drivers will have a certain amount of energy. If they go flat out all the time, they will not finish the race. We design the races in a way that drivers have to manage the energy they have, mm -hmm. which is really the way we want to, to send this message out. So they can go full power some of the time, but sometimes they have to save energy. And whoever does it on a smarter way mm -hmm. will win the race. There's another element to win the race, which is a little bit different. Fans can vote through Twitter mm -hmm. or through Weibo in China, through social media, for their favorite driver. Mm -hmm. And that driver gets an additional amount of energy during the race. Really? Yes. This you can do with electric car technology. Wait, wait, how, how do you do that? Do you do wireless electricity? I mean, what do you we, <laughs> we, well, every car has, a, everybody has a little amount of energy uh, extra, uh -huh. but only those who get more votes, the three drivers who get more votes, get to use that amount of energy. Huh. So your fans have an actual inter interaction with the result of the race, uh -huh. which is completely new in sports. Uh, you cannot score a goal in a football match or you cannot yeah. score a point in tennis, but here you can push your favorite yeah. driver to make an overtaking. Can't the drivers game the system by having all their friends and relatives like vote for them? Well, the worry is not that much the friends and relatives, it's the Chinese drivers. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, but... You know. That's great. So, uh, racing traditionally has been a, a, a great way to transfer technology, experiment with new technologies in the race, and then eventually it transfers to normal cars. So, tell us how that might happen with Formula E. What's, what's the strategy there? This is exactly what we want to be. So, Formula E wants to be a platform for future technologies. In the past, all the development of new technologies in the motor industry has come from racing from carbon uh, brakes to fuel injection. Many, many of the developments first are tested in racing and then they go to the road cars. Mm. But the electric vehicles don't have that platform yet. Mm -hmm. So that's what we want to be. Formula E to be the platform where new things are tried. Basically new storage devices or better storage devices. Batteries is one, the one that works today. Mm -hmm. But fuel cells or supercapacitors combined with batteries or any other device that will come in the future that can store more energy right. will be tested in our, in our championship and then trickle down to the road cars. What's very important is that the OEMs, the car manufacturers, are showing very, very strong interest in the championship. Mm -hmm. The first year, there is only one car and Renault is involved in it. Renault has had a really a forward role, but we're talking to other OEMs who are very interested in joining on year two because on year two, it's a free development for technology. Mm -hmm. So the different manufacturers can, can make their own cars and compete against each other because it's through competition, wanting to beat the other guy, right. that you will develop new technologies and then. Right, because you're always pushing the outside of the envelope with the technology, yeah. which, which uh, reminds me of something we were talking about uh, before we came out. Um, one of your uh, uh, team members is trying to break the land speed record yes. for, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. He did. Um, one of our teams, Venturi, is a Monaco-based team. It's led by uh, Gildo Pastor, who built this uh, car, this kind of rocket, which he takes every year to Bonneville, to, uh, to the Salt Lake. An electric rocket, right? Electric rocket, yes, right. yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, he broke the speed record on electric, 375 miles per hour. Mm. That was two years ago. And then we went, I went with him uh, to, to break the record this year. He had built this even bigger electric rocket. Um, <laughs> To, to go over 500 miles per hour on electric, but it rained and the lake was full of water, mm -hmm. which was kind of one time in, in every 50 years or something. So we couldn't really uh, break the record. But we want to have in the championship all those pioneers in the electric space mm -hmm. that, that, you know, that have, been, have been, like you say, pushing the envelope. And, right. and, and we like to have those persons involved because we want to push the envelope a lot. In this yeah. So is there a business model for this or is this I mean, or do you hope there's a business model for this? We really hope so. <laughs> me and, and, and my, what is it? Me and my investors really hope so, especially. <laughs> um, 
There is a business model uh, because uh, this kind of racing, um, like Formula One, um, can be can become a very good show, mm -hmm. and we are seeing it by the the already the, uh, the the huge interest from televisions on the championship. Mm -hmm. So we have actually very fast uh, done deals with Fox for 88 countries, including live in the U.S., mm. with Asahi TV in Japan, with ITV in the U.K., and basically we have all the world covered now on television. Mm -hmm. And then the other base for the business model is the sustainability angle of the championship. We, we don't stress that much the sustainability angle because we, we don't want to be seen as uh, uh, greenwashing or, I mean, we are a race. Right, right. And we are not a zero emission championship because right. we do have emissions. I mean, we have to fly these cars all over the world. Right. And we have to make the cars. Which and if you're charging them on emissions. coal power, I mean. And if we charge them on a coal power, <laughs> there is emissions there. Right. But we are a zero emission tailpipe championship. Right. I mean, the cars have, do have zero emissions. And we are definitely making a contribution to the electric car technology. So that, again, it's, 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 it's good for the environment in right. general. So many big corporations, we are seeing that are very keen to, to associate with us mm -hmm. because they like to sponsor or to associate with a sport mm -hmm. that has that kind. I mean, we sit halfway between sport and social corporate responsibility. Yeah. And that's a good place to be today for, for a sport property because many corporations are, you know, are very now focused or very careful with their choices in terms of what they support. Uh, so we very quickly, I mean, we, we even hadn't had one race. We've been able to have very big partnerships with big companies such mm -hmm. as you know, Michelin or Qualcomm or DHL yeah, yeah. or Tag Hilbert for the watches. Right, right. Uh, or, uh. <laughs> that wasn't a plug. Um, what's, what's it going to be like to attend one of the races? I mean, do these cars make a lot of noise or are they really quiet? I mean, pe people go to le races like, le I mean, especially Formula One. I mean, it's, it's yeah. ear shattering, but are these just going to whirr around the track or? The, the cars are going to make actually a very cool noise. Um, to be honest with you, we had no clue what noise they were going to make until we made the car. <laughs> we went there and he made the noise, which was good. Uh, <laughs> we, we want this to be, I don't know if you've seen or you remember now the, the chapter one, episode one of Star Wars. There is a pod race. Oh, right. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of feeling we want to give with this race to the fans. Because again, we're focusing on the younger generation who right. we want to convince that when they buy a car, the first car they buy is electric. So we want to go to this 10 to 16 year old generation. No? Mm -hmm. So we want to give the, this feeling of a, of a race that is the race of the future. So the noise is very important. Mm -hmm. So we think we've got that noise. What, what's it sound like? Like a jet, like a fighter jet. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, at least that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> but you will hear it. I mean, everybody yeah. will hear it. So it, it really, sound, I mean, you can hear it online. We have it on our website. We have videos of Formula One drivers driving our cars and, and it, it really sounds very, very well. But the level of sound is in the region of 80 decibels. To give an example, what's that compared to a jet? Compared to, <laughs> to a jet is much less, but to, to a Formula One car or an Indy car, they are in the region of 130 decibels, okay. which is really loud. But that's why we can race in city centers, because we have a level of noise that allows us to race in city centers. Right. Probably if we were in the same levels of noise, we, we would not be allowed to race in half of the cities that we're, that we're going to race in. Right. And finally, what, what does the, real, the old Formula One circuit think of this? Do they think it's good for the racing industry? Do they see you as a threat? I mean, there, there are mixed feelings. I mean, you know, the, the, the old petrol heads, like me, for example, which yeah. I've been in racing, like in combustion racing for 12 years, and I've really, they see it as a very weird thing. I mean, Bernie Eccleston, who is uh, the, the head of Formula One, who's been also a partner of mine, call this a, a lawn mower championship, <laughs> uh, which is fine, I mean. Uh, um, but uh, so they, they look at it uh, with a certain kind of um, skepticism. Could your car beat a Formula One car in, 25 minutes, in a 25 minute race? Not yet, but in about 10 to 15 years, maybe. That long, really? What yeah, it? unfortunately, yes. It could beat it now. Well, because what's the top speed of your car? I'll give you an example. The top speed is about 250, 270 kilometers. Sorry. Kilometers. Yeah, yeah the <laughs> kilometers. But to give you an example, they could beat a, a, a car today, but my motor is 16 kilos, mm -hmm. and it produces about 300 horsepower. If I put four of those motors next to each other, they only weigh 60 kilos. A Formula One engine weighs 100 and something. 
and they would produce 1,200 horsepower, more. Mm -hmm. But my battery would be empty in four minutes. So if we do races of four minutes, you can I beat them in beat four them. minutes. Yeah. Exactly. So maybe you should start a drag racing business. You know? That's a good idea. <laughs> Somebody else is doing it. Okay, yeah. Alejandro, we've run out of time here. Thank you so much. Thank really you very much. You. Let's hear it for Alejandro. Thank you. Okay.